We are. You talk about uh, cortisol yeah. surging, uh, yes. you know, as you're trying desperately to get into something. I'm so uh, sorry, Lori, that you're having your these patience. issues and for everybody here too. Uh, Lori, you want to share your screen and then yeah. I'll just turn it over for you. Can you make me a co-host? Because I'm going to have some video embedded in this. And if I'm co-host, the video will play better. You got it. Thank you. Am I cool now? You're the co-host. Okay. Thank you so much. You bet. So Thank I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I thank all of you for your patience. This was quite the challenge to get in, but I'm so glad uh, that I'm here. And I'm so glad that we're going to do this together. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. And we'll start the slideshow. Okay. Uh, I can see, we can see your first slide, why sexual behavior is traumatic. Yes, and now it's gonna go into the slideshow, I hope. Should do that. Okay, I think we're finally happening. <laughs> Thank you everybody again so much for your patience getting into this. So I wanna to talk to you today about why sexual betrayal is traumatic. We're gonna look at a couple of things. First, we're gonna look at what we thought we knew and it's what we thought we knew that makes this so traumatic when it all comes tumbling down. We realized that what we thought we knew is not at all the truth. And then what is the impact and a little bit about stage one of healing for the partner. So in module one, when we look at what we thought we knew once upon a time, we're gonna take a brief look at the biochemistry of belief, uh, talk about where beliefs come from and the cultural messages and assumptions that underlie why betrayal is so traumatic. So the biochemistry of belief, we are what we believe. Our beliefs are basically our guiding principles in life and they provide direction and meaning for us as we go through life. And they do this as a preset organized filter so that when we look out on the world, it helps us interpret what's happening both internally and externally. And they become like internal commands to our brain uh, so that our brain knows how to represent what's happening. It aligns with what we congruently believe to be true and then helps us move forward. In the absence of beliefs, or if we're not able to tap into our belief, we feel very disempowered. We're just confused, we're unsure, we're lost because we don't have our filters anymore to tell us which way is true north. So where do our beliefs come from? Well, they start with what we hear and keep on hearing from other people ever since we we're children, even before that. I spent 20 years as a childbirth educator. I uh, attended thousands of couples while they were um, expecting their first or second or third babies. And one of the things that I learned during that time is hearing is one of the first senses that a child growing in utero develops so they can actually hear what's going on outside uh, while they're growing and developing. So we start our beliefs very, very early. Our beliefs uh, come from our environment, our immediate home environment, our town, our village, events that have happened during our lifetime or previous lifetimes where we read in history, uh, knowledge that we gain when we go to school or um, knowledge that we uh, are imparted from our family, our past experiences. And then of course we know the power of visualization to create affirmative beliefs. Our religious beliefs, our faith beliefs also contribute to uh, what we think about love. And religion on its surface is a system of beliefs and practices that we use to be in relationship with God or some higher power. But there's a deeper, sometimes hidden meaning to that about not being alone. And this thing about not being alone is so important as one reason why betrayal is 
tremendously traumatic because we are created to be in relationship. It's absolutely essential for our physical and psychological well-being. We need to feel that we have someone in this world who has our back. So not being alone is really important. And this video gives a brief overview. Uh, uh, you know what? One thing I'm going to do here, I'm just going to, I've got to, um, there's one thing I have to do in order for the video to play well. Um, when I share my screen, one second here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and optimize it. Okay, now it's optimized. So this gives a brief overview of uh, the importance of love in world religions. So it, it seems that universally, um, many, many faith traditions teach their adherents something about the importance of love. So we're just surrounded by this idea that love is important and our culture has reinforced it. For example, Mahatma Gandhi, who um, so many of us admire, you know, taught where there is love, there is life. Elizabeth Gilbert, a lot of you probably have read her books. Uh, has written to be fully seen by someone then and to be loved anyhow, this is a human offering that can border on the miraculous. And that is so true. It really feels uh, miraculous when somebody sees us as we really are and loves us just as we are. So healing. This is a beautiful um, quote by Pablo Nuna. I love you without knowing how or when or from where. I love you simply without problems or pride. I love you in this way because I do not know any other way of loving but this, in which there is no I or you, so intimate that your hand upon my chest is my hand, so intimate that when I fall asleep, your eyes close. This is a sense of being completely at one of um, being merged and totally supported in life. Lao Tzu said being deeply loved by someone gives you strength while loving someone deeply gives you courage. And we see that over and over again. When someone really loves us, we find within ourselves an incredible amount of strength. And if we love someone, we will put our lives on the line to try to help them. Maya Angelou, who I just adore. Love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles. It leaps fences. It penetrates walls to arrive at its destination. And here's the key, full of hope. Hope is an important part of love. And what betrayal does is it just shatters hope. And finally, Nicholas Spark. I'm nothing special of this, I'm sure. I'm a common man with common thoughts and I've led a common life. There are no monuments dedicated to me and my name will soon be forgotten, but I've loved another with all my heart and soul. And to me, this has always been enough. These are really powerful words that go deep into our consciousness and subconsciousness about what love can do for us and how we are to show up if we are loving people. And so, I love, I don't know how many of you are Princess Bride fans. I love the movie. And here we have in this movie, this, um, this great little, little scene um, where Princess Humperdinck is trying to, uh, Prince Humperdinck is trying to marry Princess Buttercup. Marriage. Marriage 
is what brings us together today. Marriage, that wicked arrangement, that dream within Yep, the dream within a dream, right? And here's the dream, the fairy tale. I mean, we saw it acted out. The messages were reinforced, not just in movies, not just in literature, not just in what we were taught in our faith, but we saw it in real life, the fairy tale. And um, that fairy tale creates our destiny, right? Our beliefs become our thoughts, our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions, our actions become our habits, our habits become our values and our values become our destiny. Gandhi knew that so profoundly. Jesus kind of summed it up into one simple phrase, as we think in our hearts, so are we. And so it kind of looks like this. Our life story is the visible manifestation of our beliefs. Our beliefs create our values. Our values inform our choices. Our choices set consequences in motion and consequences aren't necessarily a negative thing. They can be a positive thing. Our choices just set a series of conditions in motion. And those consequences or conditions create our life story. And it goes around and around and around. So our life story is a visible manifestation of our beliefs. And this, as we're going to see in a moment, is one reason why it's so shattering when our life story becomes very different than what we thought our beliefs led us to believe it should show up as. So here's another way to look at this. We have an idea, a belief, we take an action, we get a result. We plant a seed in the soil of our life and it grows up into something. And this is what we expect in life. So we saw it, we were taught it, and we followed it. And then it all comes tumbling down. Okay, so we're gonna look at what happens when it all comes tumbling down. So trauma is a very severe shock or very upsetting experience that can cause psychological and physical damage and may have long lasting effects. And one of the key um, components of something being traumatic is a feeling of being disempowered and the sense that the world is an unsafe place. And this picture of the fish in the blender is so perfect. The fish cannot get out of this situation and it's not gonna turn out well. So a feeling of powerlessness is actually the most important part of why something is traumatic. If we think we can get away from it, if we don't feel powerless, if we feel equipped to handle it, it's not nearly as traumatic. This is a story from my life. This is my puppy. His name is Ernie. And um, he's just, I think he's adorable. He's my guy. And this is Ernie when he was a puppy. And here he is, Ernie is a Shih Tzu. And you'll notice he's getting a bit long in the hair here. Shih Tzus don't have fur, they have hair and it just grows and grows and grows. So here's Ernie at his first Christmas under the tree after he's completely wrecked the joint in his Harley jacket. And the boy is in need of some serious attention. So uh, we took him to the groomer. The problem was the groomer used the um, cutting tools on his face and she cut his eye. And here I am at the vets holding him. And it was a sad picture because he was partially groomed and partially not groomed. So some of them looked good. Some of them was really ragtag. And uh, here he is with a cone around his face because his eye had been cut and he needed some immediate attention. And he had to spend the night at the vets and when he came home, and here's, here's the thing about my little puppy. Ernie, when he, uh, before this happened to him, we took him a lot of different places and uh, we had a store nearby where we lived that was in, we lived in a rural area and you could bring the dogs in. And every time I would take Ernie in, all the cashiers were like, oh, Ernie's here, Ernie's here. He'd you know, run up, he'd give him kisses. Everybody he met on the road, he'd give kisses. He was the happiest little puppy that you ever met. And here he is after the trauma. Ernie lived like this for weeks. 
he would not move. He, uh, he wouldn't even, when I tried to take him out to go to the bathroom, he wouldn't move. He would be absolutely frozen in position. Why? Because he learned that uh, if I move, I'm going to get hurt. Because what had happened was he tried to kiss the groomer with a sweet little act of love. And that's when the razor slipped and clipped his eye. So he learned, I don't move because I'm not safe. So that's just was a right in my face example of what happens when you've been traumatized. So examples of ordinary trauma events are things like the sudden death of a loved one, physical or sexual assault, witnessing violence, natural disasters. We've had tremendous uh, fires out on the West Coast and lots of people have lost their homes. We've had hurricanes, tornadoes, tidal waves. Those are natural disasters that are hugely traumatic. Car, being in a car accident is traumatic. Military combat is traumatic. But there's a difference between traumatic events and betrayal trauma. And betrayal trauma occurs when someone we depend on for our survival or are significantly attached to violates our trust in a critical way. That's Dr. Jill Manning. And this goes back to, again, our ideas about love. Loving and being loved is our true nature. From the day we're born, we look for love because it is love that nourishes our soul. So here we are loving because it's so important, because our culture has told us it's important, our faiths have told us it's important, but loving makes us vulnerable to betrayal because betrayal can only happen if you love. To betray, there has to first have been trust. If you didn't trust someone, it's not betrayal. They just did something dumb and something hurtful. But if you trusted someone and then they harm you, that is betrayal. So here we are again, back with Princess Di. Very much so. Do you think Mrs. Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Okay, that's the look I want you to notice right there. That sadness. You're going from the princess, who was the ultimate example of a fantasy fulfilled, to a betrayed wife humiliated before the world by the Rottweiler. So the fairy tale ended and they didn't live happily ever after. And the sad look on both their faces here as con contrasted to, I mean, it was almost too classic, the kissing her hand there on their wedding day and the smile on her face. It just, um, it speaks so much to what happens when people betray us. So as it all falls down, here we have, you know, Bill Cosby, The Huxtables. I used to love that show. I loved Cosby. It was so funny. And uh, then we found out that he wasn't who we thought he was when he uh, was charged with sexual assault. And, and what we begin to discover is, well, we thought we were living with the Cleavers, Warden June Cleaver. I am dating myself. That was a show I grew up with, Leave it to Beaver where mom and dad were loving parents who treated their kids right. And Wally and the Beave were really good kids who just got into normal problems, but everybody always pulled together. Uh, and then you discover, well, the Cleavers don't live here anymore. Uh, life is not what I thought it was. People are not who I thought they were. And this discovery of sexual betrayal, 84% of disclosures were accidental or unplanned. And Dr. Barbara Steffens found in her research that 75% of the discoveries of sexual betrayal occurred when a partner discovered evidence um, or stumbled upon something like a text from an affair partner, maybe a, maybe a phone call from an affair partner to the text. Uh, maybe she discovered something on the computer where it was obvious that um, 
porn was being downloaded, or perhaps she didn't have any um, direct evidence yet that there was some type of sexual betrayal going on. But she was like, this, this marriage is not working. I know we need outside help. I'm not sure what the problem is, but we've got to go get help. So 75% of the discoveries that there was sexual betrayal occurred under those kinds of conditions. And it's a real shock when that happens. It's a real shock. Um, and I love this quote by Stephen Dietz, one should rather die than be betrayed. There is no deceit in death. It delivers precisely what it's promised. But betrayal though, betrayal is the willful slaughter of hope. And if you remember back to the Maya Angelou quote about the link between hope and love, the love is full of hope, hope for today, hope for tomorrow, but betrayal slaughters hope. So here we are, we've been violated by somebody we relied upon or depended upon for our safety and security, not a stranger, but somebody that we relied on and depended on. And the nature of the relationship is the most important issue and how great the feelings of betrayal are. So, for example, if your boss betrays you, that's pretty tough for sure. Uh, but if your best friend betrays you, that has an even greater impact because your best friend is someone who's always supposed to have your back. So uh, Dr. Jill Manning gives these examples of betrayal trauma, contracting an STD from a supposedly faithful partner. Um, I've had many cl partner clients who one of the ways they found out that the cheating was going on is they went for a routine gynecological exam or they went for an exam as part of a pregnancy and an STD was um, discovered. And they were like, what, how can that be? I mean, my husband's the only one I've been with. And then it all comes out. There could be, again, evidence of a spouse's sexual addiction. As I said before, perhaps a text message, a phone call, um, charges that are unexplained that show that money has been spent on something other than family uh, expenses. Sexual or physical abuse by a parent obviously is an example of betrayal trauma and financial deceitfulness in marriage. I've had partners um, whose spouses who are involved in sexual addiction or problematic sexual behavior uh, who spent upwards of a half a million dollars on their addiction. It's a lot of money. Um, 401ks that have been cleaned out, savings accounts that have been cleaned out, second mortgages that have been taken out. Um, to fund uh, sexual uh, activities that are not supportive of the marriage. And that's a form of betrayal. So one of the interesting things about um, betrayal trauma, even though it shares a lot of the same psychological, physiological and neurological symptoms that uh, are part of fear-based behavior, it, it's distinct in two important ways. And, and these are really important in terms of understanding why partners can be so emotionally dysregulated. And this goes first one back to the idea that the perpetrator is in close relationship with the victim. So the violation of trust is experienced as very, very personal. It's not a random offense. It feels very personal, even though, um, I tell my partners, you didn't cause this, you can't cure it and you can't control it. It still feels that it was very personal because this was my person. This was the one I trusted. This was, um, and they did this to me. So because there's a close relationship, it's experienced as, as almost a personal attack. Even though oftentimes people who have problematic sexual behavior will say, well, I wasn't even thinking about you when I did this. Well, yes, that's the whole point. You weren't even thinking about me. And 
you're always supposed to be thinking about my well-being because I'm always thinking about your well-being and how any action I take is going to affect you. So because of the personalized nature of the betrayal, betrayal trauma can be more stabilizing to our social schema than a strictly fear-based trauma. And, um, and that's because it ripples out to everything. It ripples out to what do I tell my family? What about my friends? What happens with my job? Um, it can be very destabilizing. So this is one reason why betrayal research has shown that betrayal trauma is associated with more physical illness, uh, with anxiety, dissociation, and depressions than traumas that are low in betrayal. And we'll take a deeper dive into that in a minute, like what's really going on? Why is there more physical illness? Uh, why is there more depression and anxiety in betrayal than um, traumas that are low in betrayal. For example, if someone drives into you, if you're driving your car and someone crashes into your car, that is a traumatic event. It's not personal. Um, and you may still have the PTSD flashbacks of that event, but the likelihood of developing a physical illness from that or depression from that is much less likely than it is from a betrayal trauma. The second way that Dr. Manning points out that there's the difference between betrayal trauma and an event-related trauma is that there's a high risk of reoccurrence. And this becomes really important when you're talking about a marriage situation or whether if it's not a marriage situation, a partnership situation, whether it's dating or people who are living together, um, because there's a close and interconnected relationship between these two people. And it can be really difficult to confront the situation or to think about severing ties with this person, especially if there are children involved. Partners will often stay in a relationship when there are children because they're trying to make sure that their children are gonna have a roof over their head and food in their bellies. They keep hoping that things are gonna work out, that, um, their loved one will go into recovery. And I'm, I'm using here mostly female terms for partners and mostly male terms for those who have problematic sexual behavior. And I know that it goes both ways. There are men who have experienced sexual betrayal too. Um, but the vast majority of my clients are women. So I'm just using that term, but I, I want you to know I am aware that it does go both ways. But because people stay in these relationships, either because of children or because of their faith, or perhaps you have a partner who is an older partner. And I have uh, partners who are in their 50s, 60s, even 70s, when they discover what's been going on, even though they always knew there was something, but then they finally discover what it is. And now the stakes are really high for an older partner because of the financial ramifications if the marriage ends. Um, and because now there's children and, and grandchildren usually. So the ripple impact on the whole life of the partner is much larger. So they tend to try to stay and keep hoping that, um, that their loved one is going to go into recovery. But we know that the risk of reoccurrence is high in this particular kind of behavior. And so the trauma is often repeated. So in this example, Dr. Um, Manning points out that if you're physically assaulted by a stranger, we're unlikely to encounter that same person a second time. But the betrayed spouse is someone who shares our life. And if they're no longer sharing our life and our home, they may be sharing children with us or extended family with us and finances. So this makes it um, you know, what are we going to do about this? How am I going to move forward? It makes it infinitely more complex and it requires a lot of thought. And even for partners who choose to divorce, um, the impact goes on and on with the children, with the financial situation, with loss of friends uh, and family members who choose to take sides. 
So this is one reason why partners often will stay, at least for many, sometimes many years, while they're trying to figure out, is it better to leave or go? And meanwhile, there's this high risk of reoccurrence. So they're being re-traumatized over and over. So the trauma perspective in terms of the partner and spouse, uh, going back to the idea that trauma is a response to an event that shatters our world and our assumptions and our sense of safety. We have often left terrified. We're very unsettled. We feel very unsafe in the situation. Every area of our life is impacted. And this is a question that partners ask over and over again. Who is this person that I've been waking up next to for 10, 20, 30 years? Who is this person? I thought I knew them. I've had partners who grew up with their spouse. They lived next door and their families were thrilled that they got married. And then 10, 15, 20 years down the road, uh, they discover this, this secret life. And they're like, who is this person I've been with all my life? I don't know who you are anymore. That's very unsettling. Has it all been a lie? And this is something partners ask over and over again. Has anything been real? Any time that he said he loved me? Any nice thing that he did for me? What about my family? Has this all been a lie? And so going back to that um, earlier slide where we talked about how our beliefs give us the ability to uh, have perceptions about life, they're a filter for us. Well, when they're not working anymore, when our belief in who this person is isn't working anymore, it sets up feelings of tremendous disorientation. We're just not sure which end is up. From the couple's perspective, from the coupleship, who we are is shaken and shattered. I thought you were my person. I thought you loved me. I thought you were always going to be there for me. And that's all shattered. The sense of safety within the relationship is ruptured. Partners no longer feel safe. They don't know what they can trust anymore. They don't know that they can believe anything that's said anymore or even anything that they see when something nice is done for them. If, the, um, if their spouse brings them flowers or buys them a gift, they don't know, is that real? Is that true? Or is that a guilty conscience? So there's no safety in, in being able to receive anything anymore. Partners often will isolate um, because they're trying to figure it out. They're confused. They don't know what to say to other people. They don't know who to trust anymore. So withdrawing is a natural thing for partners to do while they try to figure it out. They may have initially reached out and talked to maybe their faith community or some friends, maybe family members. Sometimes those are safe conversations that partners have and they feel supported. But oftentimes partners are shamed or told what to do, like, well, I would leave him or I would do this, or why did you do that? Or well, how, how could he do that? And, and it's not helpful. And so they tend to isolate. They're afraid. They're afraid for themselves. They're afraid for their children. They're afraid for the person that they love who suddenly becomes somebody that they don't know. So they're afraid for this person and they're afraid of this person, the person that they never thought they would have to be afraid of. Oftentimes partners feel different from others because they're like, well, nobody else has this going on in their lives. Um, you know, everybody else has a happy family because they're seeing on the outside or at least normal problems in their marriage. And one of the things when I do the partner support program for Begin Again Institute, uh, one of the things that the partners always say that they love about that is this is a group where they can feel safe. They don't feel different from the other women in this group. They feel heard and understood, but they don't feel that way with their broader social circle, who many, obviously, people who probably care deeply about them, but just don't know what to say. Their future is in jeopardy. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And partners begin to realize how incredibly future-oriented we are because we've 
Um, we've really staked a claim on knowing what's gonna to happen tomorrow, but suddenly we don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. Our true history is shaken. We don't know. When we look at the pictures of family events, we don't know uh, if we can look at any of those anymore. And oftentimes uh, partners will take down all of the family pictures. And this is what they're looking at. When their life seemed so clear before, now it's, it's just a wreckage. And this picture from the morning of, after 9-11, or it might not have been the morning after, but it was shortly after 9-11. What I know about the morning of 9-11 is that uh, that was one of the most beautiful mornings that um, New York City had had in a long time. The sky was blue, it was great temperature, everything just looked wonderful. And in a very short period of time, there was just a heaping pile of wreckage and a lot of death. And that's exactly what happens to partners. They can be motoring along thinking that their life is good. And then in a moment, it all comes crashing down and they don't know what to do with the wreckage because it's so huge. They're not sure how to dig out from underneath it. So they go back again to their life story and they're like, wait a minute. Uh, how did a nice girl like me get into a nice, a horrible story like this? They start to second guess everything. They just look at everything and it leads to a crisis of belief because their brain is struggling to make sense of this because the experience doesn't fit what they believed. So it's like, uh, I think Dr. Jake Porter is the one who said that a discovery of sexual betrayal is like someone took all the files in your filing cabinet and threw them on the floor. Whereas before your life seemed very organized, you knew how to proceed, perceive what was going on. You knew how to respond to what was going on because you had a set of beliefs. Um, now nothing makes sense and you don't have any idea how to put it back together again. So let's take a deeper look into that, into the psychological impact, the physiological impact, and then what do we do? How do we find safety and stability from that place? Well, Dr. Barbara Steffens and her research found that approximately 69% of spouses show signs of PTSD, at least initially, and some go on to have even um, complex PTSD, which we'll talk about more in a minute. They have trouble with emotional regulation, they have extreme anxiety, even depression. There's brain fog. They're unable to read, to concentrate, and to think clearly. Well, why is that? Well, because every part of their life is under threat. Their marriage is under threat. They don't know what the future is going to hold for their marriage. They thought this was a kind of a till death do us part arrangement. And now they're not sure they want to stay in the marriage. They, they just don't know. Her, our children are under threat. Um, and this is a, can be an age specific thing in that um, little children might see that mom is emotionally distressed and not know what's going on. Mom might be um, not have the bandwidth to be comforting to her children. She may snap at them because she's so stressed herself. So her children may experience um, great discomfort, but children also are like canaries, I say. They will show the family pain even when the reason for the pain is hidden. Children often act out. And a mother will do so many things to try to protect her children. She's afraid for her children's future. She wants her children to have a good relationship with their father. So she doesn't know what to tell them. She doesn't want to most partners don't want to tell their children what's going on because they don't want to do anything to harm that relationship. Um, and so they're trying to protect them, but they feel like they're not even sure they can trust their husbands with the children, especially uh, depending on the kind of pornography that's being watched. You know, are my kids safe? Our social circle, a partner's social circle, her friends, um, what does she say to her friends? Does she say anything to her friends? Will her friends understand? Uh, will her friends judge her? You know, who's going to be there for her? Can she trust anyone? Her faith, what she believed about God, what she believed about life, what she believed about herself and others. 
um, that's all under threat because it didn't turn out the way she thought it was going to turn out. And partners will often double down and try harder and harder with the same belief system, but it keeps not working for them. So the longer they do that, the more their um, ability to have faith in life and in, in themselves um, and even in God gets tested. So that all feels like that's under threat. And of course, our, their future is under threat. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, is it going to cheat again? Am I going to get an STD? Um, what about our finances? Can we keep our home? You know, what's going to happen with our holidays? What's going to happen uh, with our life? Is this marriage going to survive? And then finally, the health. And partners, uh, autoimmune diseases are not unusual in partners. We're going to talk a little bit more about what happens to the um, physical health of the partner here in a second. So this gives you a picture of what's going on in the brain to try to understand why some of these symptoms are showing up. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with the amygdala, and that's down here at about four o'clock. And that's what I call the alarm or your sonar. It's uh, one of the first structures in our brain to process sensory information. And it does this to determine very quickly whether we are in any kind of uh, threatening situation. So it will uh, scan a person, a situation or an event to see if there's any threat here. And what it does is it goes to the hippocampus, which is like a search engine call it my, our Google search engine. Um, and it says to the uh, hippocampus, uh, is this okay? Is this a dangerous situation? If the hippocampus doesn't have any kind of stored memory that says this person is not safe, the hippocampus is like, nope, you're good. And um, I'll give you an example here of how this worked with a partner I had where, uh, again, someone who married um, a, a, a guy she grew up with, um, thought she knew him very well. And the normal routine when he came home from work was he'd walk into the house, he'd come over and he'd give her a kiss and, and then they'd chat about the day. And then she discovered that he had been cheating on her from the time they were dating. And now they were about 15 years into the marriage with several children. And so one day, he comes home a little bit late and he doesn't walk over to kiss her right away. He just kind of hangs back. And, um, and she said, the next thing that happened was something she absolutely never would have believed could happen. She, it was like she was watching herself from the ceiling. She completely lost it. She turned into a screaming woman and she couldn't stop herself. And, um, and she had to leave the room because she couldn't stop. And so I asked her, I said, well, what would have happened before you discovered he was cheating if he'd come home a little bit late and he kind of hung back and didn't give you a kiss? And she said, I would have just told myself he must have had a tough day at work. I'm going to give him some space. I said, would you have lost it? She said, no, absolutely not. I would have just gone ahead and made dinner and not had a worry. I said, well, what was different this time? And she thought, she said, oh, I know what was different. This time I told myself, I bet the reason why he's like that is because he stopped off at the strip club on the way home. So in the first instance, her hippocampus had no search tags that said coming home a little bit late and seeing, feeling a little distant had any threat to it at all. But this time there was a search tag that said maybe he stopped off at the strip club. And so she totally lost it. Um, and what happens when we start to lose things, the stronger the perceived threat, the more the hip, what happens with the hypothalamus, that's kind of the pressure gauge that regulates our body's functions. And it also um, has reactions, physical reactions to stressors. So it activates a stress response, a fight, flight, or freeze response. And then the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that is our executive functioning, the part that tells us, okay, now that we know what's going on, here's what we're gonna do. This part of our brain under constant stress actually um, slows way, way down. Um, we have all kinds of brain fog 
we're not able to think clearly, we're not able to make good decisions. And it feels very scary when you suddenly say, I don't know what to do. I, 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 can't, I can't process this. Our memory, we have memory difficulties. Um, and even simple tasks that we used to be able to knock out, we just can't do anymore because all the stress right here when we're under perceived threat and our executive functioning is no longer working. Instead, we're, we're pumping cortisol. So it shows up like this, anxiety, difficulty regulating intense emotions, just like the partner I just talked to you about. Um, women who have never used four letter words, this is, this is when it starts. Women who've never raged, this is when it will start. Intense emotions. Hypervigilance, again, now the amygdala is really looking for any kind of danger out there. Because uh, what happens is the partner says, I missed it. I am never going to miss it again. Feeling overwhelmed. There's too much sensory information coming in. And again, the whole belief system has been crashed. So when our beliefs are crashed, we don't have any way to really process what's going on. And that leads to feelings of confusion and overwhelmed. And then again, withdrawal and isolation because we're not sure how to be out in the world anymore. Difficulty concentrating, um, almost like an ADD thing where you, you just can't sit down and actually knock out a project because your brain is going all over the planet. And then avoidance, avoidance of painful stimuli, avoidance of people, even avoidance of the feelings that are inside because they seem so intense. Flashbacks, um, this especially happens uh, when I've had partners who perhaps they discovered a text message or a sexting video that their um, husband sent to an affair partner or prostitute, that will flash back for them. Negative thoughts, uh, they're constantly circling the drain with um, all kinds of negative thoughts. And usually it's things like, what's wrong with me? Why was I so stupid? Why am I not enough? Numbness and detachment. They may feel numb. Numbness is a way we cope when things are too overwhelming. Um, we're just like, okay, I'm just not gonna feel at all. And then they detach from the situation, but not in a healthy way, in a way of almost like they're dream walking because nothing seems real anymore. Sleep and appetite disturbances. It's very common for partners to experience tremendous difficulty with sleep. They may have uh, not be able to sleep at all, or they may sleep and wake up constantly during the night. And then other somatic symptoms like headaches, tremors, um, feeling nauseous. Betrayal, trauma, it's just a deeply shattering experience. And sometimes symptoms show up right away, but other times they have a delayed onset. So um, what I would see sometimes in partners, at least initially, they may kind of be going through the motions um, in shock almost, but then uh, grief shows up, skepticism, like it's sort of like a yeah, right kind of feeling, shame, feeling tremendous shame. Um, and then some par partners even engage in high risk behaviors themselves. Um, for example, uh, they may start drinking. I've had partners who became alcoholics after they discovered uh, that there was a sexual addiction in their marriage. They, I've had partners who went online and tried to surf uh, for dates because they wanted to feel wanted. That's a high risk behavior. And these delayed reactions can start months and sometimes years after the initial discovery of betrayal. It might be an anniversary that, that kicks them off. Um, it might be they find something and all of a sudden, all these uh, traumatic feelings that have been bottled up inside of them are just triggered and it comes out. And you see this with combat veterans too, where maybe they return home from war and they seem to be doing really well and then before the July comes and they go off, uh, suddenly they're right back in Afghanistan. And as, um, as I said earlier, one of the problems with betrayal trauma is the likelihood 
that there will be a reoccurrence is high. So the more stress that partners are under, the more reoccurrences there are, the more likely that the uh, PTSD, because it's never been post, remember PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, if you're still living in the situation, it's never post, you're always in it. And so um, the trauma can become complex. And I've heard partners say all of these things, like sometimes they wish they're dead and they're in pain most of the time and they, they just feel spacey, they feel brain fog, like they can't think straight. High level functioning women, I've worked with women who are doctors, who are directors of companies, um, very successful women and, and it's terrifying to them because they suddenly can no longer do their work. Um, the simplest tasks just feel overwhelming to them. And they feel stupid because they feel like they're a doormat. They, they just don't know how to get out of the way of this huge tidal wave of, um, of addiction that's washing over their lives. When we live in this kind of high stress situation for extended periods of time, we're just pumping cortisol all the time. And so one of the things that happens is um, weight gain. Cortisol will pack on the weight. And sometimes, you know, that's because partners are eating to try to comfort themselves and carbs. You know, there's very few problems in life that can't be handled by suitable application of chocolate or carbs. <laughs> so sometimes it's because they're eating, but it's not always because they're eating. Sometimes they're not eating and they're still gaining weight because of what happens with the insulin response within the body and the, and the weight can get packed on. Thyroid uh, problems are common with partners. I've had a number of partners who had thyroid cancer or some type of thyroid misfunction, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, the natural killer cells in our body are lowered. And then there's an increased risk of osteoporosis. Uh, there's a passage in the book of Proverbs that says a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And it does. There's just something about um, constant sadness, constant feeling uh, overwhelmed and helpless that affects our bones. So Dr. Sins did a study on uh, with partners and asked them, you know, like, what's, what's happening? How is this showing up for you? Here's several quotes uh, from the partners that she surveyed. And I can say that, and I've worked with hundreds of partners, that my partners have said the very same things to me, not being able to read. It's almost like the words get stuck on the page. It's very scary. Uh, getting lost a lot. It's not uncommon for partners who are driving to an appointment or driving to meet a friend and they've, they've gone this way many, many times. And all of a sudden they get to a stop sign and they're like, um, do I go left or right? I don't really know. I can't remember how to get there. I've had partners who are shaking uncontrollably. I've had partners who develop narcolepsy where they just pass out. Um, their nervous systems are just so overwhelmed. So their brain shuts everything down. Partners who throw up, partners who can't sleep, who can't eat, who cry constantly. So um, this has to do with allostatic load, which is the wear and tear on the body that accumulates as we're exposed to repeated or chronic stress. So you're, you're seeing here in this, um, this picture, the various factors that are going to lead to allostatic load. So one of the first ones is environmental stressors. So that's things like what's going on at work, what's going on at home, what's happening in the neighborhood. Right now we have tremendous environmental stressors. So work is often changed. It's either people have lost their jobs, they've lost their businesses, they're scrambling to make their businesses survive or they're working from home. Um, at the same time, their kids are being homeschooled and they're trying to juggle it all. And if you put that on top of a partner who's trying to cope with betrayal trauma, that's a pretty crushing load. Major life events. Um, major life events don't all have to be negative. They can be positive things. They can be a new baby. They can be, we bought a new home. Or they can be, my father died. 
they can be, um, I got a divorce. They can be things like 9-11 um, or um, some of the instability in the world today. Those are major life events. And then trauma or abuse. If there's been a past history of abuse or if even if abuse is going on currently, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. Uh, I've had partners whose um, husbands have raped them as part of a sexual fantasy from porn. Uh, certainly there's a tremendous amount of emotional and psychological abuse because lying is all about trying to alter someone's perception of reality, which is a form of abuse. So all of those things together are the major big block things that can be stressors in our lives. But then we go down to the individual differences of how all of these top line events are interpreted. And some of the way um, it gets interpreted has to do with our development, how we grew up. Like, did we grow up in a home where we were deeply loved and fully supported? Well, then that's going to create more resilience. If we grew up in a home where we didn't have that, where we had a, a lot of adverse childhood experiences, then we're already, um, our bucket's not very full to be able to manage any additional stressors. The gene situation, and the study of epigenetics is, is really fascinating and it's, um, and it's impacting how we're treating uh, addicts too because the the idea of epigenetic gene expression is changed by environmental factors the underlying genetic code may stay the same but the way the dna is read and translated can vary depending on uh, what happened to our forefathers which is just fascinating for example um there were stress responses in children and grandchildren of holocaust survivors and uh were different than children who were not um, grandchildren and, and children of Holocaust survivors. So a Holocaust survivor, their descendants had more uh, increased stress reactions than someone who hadn't been through that. And the same thing was true for food related reactions in children and grandchildren of famine survivors. And um, so this is just a fascinating new way that we're looking at it. But what science is, is thinking now is that epigenetic changes are thought to play an important role in post-traumatic stress dis disorder, um, both in whether or not it develops and how resilient the person is going to be after that. And so this all leads to the idea of perceived stress. Is there a threat? Is there no threat? Do we feel helpless? Do we have resources? Are we always hypervigilant? What are our behavioral responses? Are we fighting? Are we fleeing? Are we freezing? Are we eating stuff we shouldn't be eating? Are we smoking or drinking? What are we doing? Are we doing healthy behavior responses to try to cope with all of these threats? And all of that contributes to how we adapt to this allostatic load, how well we're going to get through this with the with a maximum amount of resiliency and the minimum amount of ongoing harm. So I know a lot of times uh, when, at least historically, when partners would go for help, uh, one of the first questions they would be asked after they revealed that there was some type of uh, sexual betrayal in the marriage was, well, tell me about your relationship with your father. Or tell me about what it was like when you were growing up. And that is a family of origin approach looking at previous relational trauma. And it's not that that's not important, but that's important down the road. But here, when I'm talking about the difference in meaning making and expectations, there is an overlap. When you have betrayal trauma and previous relational trauma, this intersection right here turns out to be important in terms of what meaning the partner makes of the situation and what expectation she has of the situation. If she can remember a time when life was different, as in better, then there's not gonna be as much overlap here. She's gonna have some hope that life can be better for her. If she knows that, that the world has been a safe place for her, 
she has resources she can go to, she has social support, then there's not going to be as much, there's not really a big overlap here. She's going to be more resilient. If she has experiences of feeling loved and cared for, she's going to have different treatment needs than a partner who grew up in a home where there was a lot of trauma. But uh, the approach that we take at the Association of Partners of Sex Addicts Trauma Specialists, which I'm the partner, uh, I am the president of that organization, is that while we understand that family of origin issues impact the partner's reserves to respond to betrayal, a partner's most immediate needs are for safety in the current situation. So the way we would handle it, I love this cartoon. <laughs> Let's get the monkey off your back and then we'll take care of the foot in your mouth and then we'll deal with a thorn in your side. So we tend to deal right away with what's going on right now. And that's kind of a lead into and just a very quick overview of the first phase of what we do with the multidimensional partner trauma model. Um, because we, we start with the understanding that the partner of a sex addict or someone with problematic sexual behavior has responses that serve as reactions to a stressor that's traumatic in nature. There are predictable emotional, behavioral, and physiological ways that her body and mind attempt to survive and adapt to a dangerous situation because she is seeking what she can't find, which is safety in an unsafe situation. So this is one way that the APSATS model differs from other models. Uh, an addict-centric model, which is a historic model, tends to focus on the needs of the addict, while the partner-centric model focuses on the relationship through the partner's experience and needs, as well as through the needs of the addict. In the addict-centric model, the partner or the family is seen as support for the addict's treatment, but in a more partner-centric model, uh, we recognize the sense of victimization and self-blame that the partner feels as a core wounding of her trauma. Partners are often seen as out of control or controlling in an addict-centric model rather than trying to adapt to life with an addict. In a partner-centric model, we look at this as the partner is trying to restore a sense of personal agency in the recovery process. So actions that can be labeled as controlling are just, there are ways she's trying to feel safe. Um, in an addict-centric model, the partner is seen as having her own disease of co-addiction or codependency. But in a partner-centric model, we transform the partner's trauma story into an empowerment story. So again, in our model, we deal with the mental health of the partner rather than label her as having a disease. We believe that healing and restoration is possible. Um, and while I would say that recovery is ongoing, it's not a matter of, hi, my name is Lori. Um, I'm a codependent because I married somebody with a sexual addiction. Uh, recovery is simply thinking in healthy ways. So yes, we do continue to work on our own recovery, but from a place of healing and restoration, not from a place of, I will always be a victim of this thing that happened to me. Um, we believe that the symptoms that the partner are showing are consistent with traumatic stress rather than symptoms of her own disease. We believe that she's impacted by events beyond his or her control, rather than culpable because she picked this person or because she loves somebody who has a disease. And we believe in traumatic growth and resilience and we acknowledge that and we cheer it on as opposed to seeing um, the partner as powerless and having to claim powerless. She's powerless over other people's choices, but she's very empowered in her own choices. And so what we do then in phase one of our model, and there's three phases in the multidimensional partner trauma model. The first one is achieving safety and stability. The second one is mourning and remembrance. And the third one is reconnection. But I'm just going to do a really quick flyby here of what we do to help the partner achieve some sense of safety and some sense of, of stable, stability. 
So one of the things we do is some psychoed and we start usually around boundaries and requirements. What kind of boundaries do you need to have in place so that you can feel safe in this situation? And some education about problematic sexual behavior, understanding that this is not about you, this is about someone else's trauma, someone else's choices can be very helpful. Therapeutic disclosure, making sure that future disclosures are not these driveway disclosures where uh, someone unburdens their conscience and dumps all kinds of hurtful things on their partner, but it's done in a safe way where support is present and addressing possible relational abuse. And then for stabilization, tools to learn how to manage emotions and triggers, good self-care. Again, there's some psychoeducation around how to do all of this. And then addressing treatment-induced trauma. If a partner has gone in for help and um, been shamed, I've had so many partners who went to their faith community first for help and were told they just needed to be more sexual with their husbands and then he wouldn't need to cheat on them. Um, that's treatment-induced trauma. So that can cause all kinds of emotional meltdowns. And then finally, also addressing relational disturbances because a sexual addiction has a strong relational component with a whole family. Um, and so we work on how can we have some type of stability here in the relationships. And so this is, um, this is my little boy now. Uh, here he is out on our boat, um, just enjoying life, having a good life. And here's me enjoying my life and having a good life too. Um, after having been through a 33 year marriage uh, with somebody who had a, a very active sexual addiction, um, that healing is not only possible, but it's wonderful. And we go forward and, uh, and we create lives that we really love. And we find ways to re-enter life where we feel safe and where we make contribution. So now we're open for questions. I'm going to stop sharing. All righty. Thanks, Lori. Um, wow. I want to give you a second just to take a breath and be able to uh, take a drink of water. But thank you for sharing your story and, and all that you've done today. So real quick, everyone, we're going to switch over to the Q&A session now, and this is your time to ask questions to Lori Hall. Um, post those in the Q&A button in the Zoom app, and we'll get to those. Uh, first question, um, Lori, is do you, have an, do you have online betrayal groups? So yes, I do. Um, I do. I, I have in the past done in-person groups, but now everything is virtual. You know, we're, we're COVID compliant. So yes, I do. Awesome. Okay. Thanks Dorothy for your question. And for those of you uh, that have questions, please post this in the q and I'll be going down and reviewing those as we go to share with Lori Hall. Uh, okay. So there, this is it. I'm going to kind of try to translate this question. It was from anonymous. Um, it's just a, it seems like a huge tidal wave of addiction. You use the term addiction to this. Any for, and, and I think for this, Lori, we're talking about the partner that has, you know, cheated or done something outside of the relationship. Yeah. Any further explanation to that word addiction used in this? Um, well, as you, as you know, when we did our, um, our initial conversation on this, Corey, uh, sexual addiction is not in the DSM. Um, because there's all kinds of discussion over, well, is this really an addiction? And are we, um, are we not being um, about positive sexuality if we call this an addiction? Are these people just love sex? Um, but problematic sexual behavior is another way to describe this. I use sexual addiction because it's in our title for absats. Mm -hmm. um, but problematic sexual behavior is any behavior that you engage in that creates problems in your life. It was creating problems in your relationship, problems in your work, problems in your own self, like exposing yourself to harm, you know, whether it's sexually transmitted diseases or getting involved and acting out with uh, BDSM, those kinds of things where you're exposing yourself to harm. 
this causing problems? Okay, it's causing problems. So we're gonna we're also gonna call it problematic sexual behavior. Whatever you call it, it creates pain in the partner. Mm -hmm. It's different, Corey, if the partner is in a relationship where there are defined terms of open marriage. Okay, we're gonna agree that you're allowed to do all of this. I'm allowed to do all of this. Um, nothing's secret. But if it's secret and one partner believes they're in a relationship where monogamy was promised, which just about every marriage vow has that in it, okay. and the other partner's acting out of an entirely different sense of entitlement that they don't have to, you know, align up with what they promised, that's mm -hmm. where pain is caused. So I don't know if that answers the question, yeah. but um, yeah. I will say to um, Dr. Michael Barta with um, Begin Again Institute. Uh, in Boulder, Colorado, uh, owned by ILC, who's putting on this webinar today, has specific uh, CE training on uh, sex addiction and uh, a book called Ten. So I'm going to put those into the chat in just a second. Um, but we've got that coming, in fact, in like two or three weeks, I think. Right. So yeah. I'll put those in the chat for you too. To Bart is awesome. Bart is awesome. He's the man on this. Yeah. <laughs> and you can unpack this, but Lori also works in tandem with Dr. Barda at Begin Again Institute, specifically with this for partners. It's one of the very distinctive aspects of the program is that it's just not about the person suffering from addiction, but the partner as well. And that's what Lori, you do with yes. the groups, um, providing yeah, some I'm, real support for. Uh, and I love that I get to do that. I just, can I put a plug in here for beginning? Yeah, please. Because I've been working in this field since the late 90s okay and i love begin again i love what they do with the addicts because they are they understand why people do what they do but they also don't cut any slack on the pain that it causes the partners and and what i see with my partners when i work with these women while their guys are in the intensive is many of the partners are ready to divorce before the intensive but these guys, they come out, I mean, and obviously there's a range, but many of them will come out of that intensive changed. You know, they, they will have insights about why they do what they do. They'll, they'll learn more about how to really lean into their wife and, and begin to rebuild that relationship. And hope is created. And I love that I get to be part of that because it, 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 there's, there's more, much more success than I have seen in other other ways of treating. So Dr. Bard is the man. He's great. I'll, I'll give you those links in just one okay. moment. I was trying to get that done. Okay, okay Lori, uh, Jennifer asked, could you talk about the state, the three stage model again? She missed uh, stages two and three. Oh, okay, yeah. And I didn't have that up because obviously that's a whole big thing. We do a four day uh, training on the multidimensional partner trauma model. <laughs> And I tried to squeeze it into the last couple slides, but but the three stages are um, we kind of developed those off uh, Judith Herman's model. The first stage is finding safety and stability. Um, we can't go anywhere until the partner feels safe, until she feels stable, until her her nerves calm down, her brain clears up a little bit, so she can make good decisions for her lives. The second phase is mourning and remembrance. And in that phase, well, we may go back and look at family of origin issues there. Now, it's not that we don't touch family of origin stuff in phase one, for example, around boundaries. Oftentimes, if say a partner came from a family that was not very functional, she might not learn good boundaries. So when we're trying to teach boundaries, she might say, oh, that's mean, or I could never do that. And you have to say, well, where did you learn that? Well, I learned that because this is what happened in my family. Okay, we might have to do a deeper dive into the family stuff, but first we're gonna look at that belief that you have that you're not allowed to have boundaries. So that's phase one. Phase two, mourning and remembrance. Mourning over what's been lost. So much has been lost. Our history has been lost. Everything that we thought was, it wasn't. Now, is that true? Is nothing real? Some things were real, but we don't know what to believe is real anymore. So there's a lot of mourning, a lot of remembering, 
Um, this is why sometimes partners months or even years later may have a question. I've got to go back because this, this part here wasn't clear to me. What really went on? I, I, need, I need to think about that again. And it's this overwhelming uh, sense of I'm trying to put my life back together again, try to reorganize so I know what really happened and what didn't. So that's the morning remembrance. And the third phase is reconnection. And these are not like, oh, we finish block one, then we go to block two, then we go to block three. They overlap, okay? Um, but reconnection is reconnection perhaps as a coupleship, if the coupleship can be saved. Reconnection with self, because the greatest relationship rupture is not between the addict and the partner, it's between the partner and herself. She, the self-doubt that develops is huge. The self-judgment is huge. So she has to reconnect to herself and to reconnect to life. Like how is she gonna go back out from this time of isolation, of feeling shame? How is she gonna go back out and re-engage life? So reconnection to all that is, is the third phase. Thanks, Lori. Mm -hmm. Dorothy asked uh, in part two of her question earlier about your online betrayal groups. How, did, mm -hmm. how, did, how does one refer someone to those groups? Um, you can email me, Lori, L-A-U-R-I-E, at appsats, A-P-S-A-T-S dot org, appsats dot org. I had to think there for a second. <laughs> get all the right letters in there <laughs> i'm, I'm yeah. going to put this into the chat real okay. quick as well um and also put a link to dr barter's book yes and the other link i meant to do was for the ce webinar okay Lori yeah. at appsats.org okay so yes. here's the email you can see that in the chat all right melanie asks with Dr. Stefan's research from 2005, what do we predict as the disclosure stats today with social media and technological? Bless you. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you get the last part of that? With <laughs> no, Dr. Stefan's. <laughs> yeah, with, I know. I thought I could get the yeah. end of the sentence there. With uh, Dr. Stefan's research from 2005, what do we predict, predict as the disclosure stats today with social media and technological advances? I'm not quite sure what she means about this disclosure stats. Does she mean the size of the problem? I mean, obviously in the last 15 years, the problem to me has escalated because porn is so easy, easily available. I mean, back when, when my husband became addicted, the way you access porn, I mean, obviously you went down, you got your copy of Playboy, you could get your copy of Hustler, wasn't electronic. You had to go down, you had to buy it. Um, and there, I mean, there were, there were the CD shows, but you had to kind of look for them. I mean, it wasn't like in your face all the time. Today with smartphones, computers, iPads, um, it's, it's, like, it's like a flood. It's like a flood. So I'm not sure if that's what she means. It's, uh, it, it's a much bigger problem today, I think. And... Uh -huh. um, you know, if you want a more current statistic, I can find that and, and send that off in, in terms of the size of the problem, but it's huge. Okay, it's she huge. she mm -hmm. said, yes, Stefan's had it at 75%. Um, oh, okay. Are we at 90% is what she's kind of getting at there. So. Well, this was the discovery was at 75%, the way the partner discovered. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not 100%. I'm sorry, I don't cut 100%. In other words, does, Ninety percent of the time, is it the partner? Is a partner discovering this ninety percent of the time? Is that what the question is? I think it's more around discovery. Yeah. Uh, but Melanie, if you you have because you just said that, or um, seventy five percent or so is the discovery rate. Well, the the partner usually seventy five percent of the discoveries were the partner finding something. Gotcha. Okay, or being contacted by an affair partner, which that's a really shocking thing. And I, I have clients that that's happened to. A fair part of our prostitute reached out, uh, like a prostitute who was trying to extort her, her client. You know, uh, yeah. um, I'm going to tell your wife if you don't give me so much money. And then just reached out to the wife because that's what happened. So I was like, what? <laughs> um, and I don't know if there's a higher percentage than, than that now. 
Uh, and I guess the nuance here too, Lori, from what you're saying is discovery versus disclosure. Yes, um, exactly. And and the point I think is well taken that it's very, very rare for the person who's acting out to come forth and say, I have a problem. Okay. Okay. The closer the partner gets to saying, I think there's something going on here. I'm not comfortable. She's often gaslit as a way to push her away from discovering the truth. Um, and uh, so the chances that he's gonna be forthcoming, and again, I'm using male here. I know they're female sex addicts too, um, is, is slim. It's very slim. It's almost always the partner who's gonna find out by accident um, of what's really going on. Yep, I think that's a good distinction and you partly answered, I think what, she, what uh, Melanie's trying to get at. Um, now with the discovery rates that we've talked about in the instance of mm -hmm. social media and technology yeah. mm -hmm. that maybe you know those discovery rates have gone up I think is what she's yeah and I, and I think she has a real good point there because mm -hmm. I'm thinking back to when my husband was involved with all of this um it's really hard to find any smoking guns you know because again that was back in the days when you bought the magazine mm -hmm. or, or you you had to go to the seedy part of town you know to to get some action um but now today, we have you, we have, I mean, it's, you, you've got it on the phone, right? You get the phone, right? Computer, I'm like, yeah. oh, I saw it on the phone. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'm sure it's much okay. higher. Yep. Thank you, Lori. Don says problematic sexual behaviors are considered similar to other process addictions, correct? Yes. yes. Can you address the distinct difference since it is uh, relational, intimate, and thus traumatic to a partner? The distinct differences between a process addiction and a substance addiction? I believe that's her question. Okay. We're saying they're very similar. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that I understand that trying to make a difference between a process addiction and a substance addiction because they are treated, there's some similars, similarities in how we treat them, but they are different. But in terms of the impact on the partner, um, as I said before, sexual addiction feels so much more personal because it is about the most intimate thing that you're only supposed to share with the person that you've agreed to share that with, right? I mean, it, it's like, wait a minute, this is something that it's supposed to be about for me, that you're not supposed to give away. And so how, however you label this, it feels very personal. And so therefore, for example, if you're a partner and you have a spouse who is an alcoholic. Well, that's been so enculturated. Very few people are going to blame the spouse for, you know, an alcohol or drug addiction, you know, in their loved one, right? Um, although some people might because they're just very uninformed and they blame everybody anyway, but, but very few people are going to do that. And it doesn't feel as personal. Yes, there's the same sense of, you are disconnected from me because you're off in your addiction. You're not, you know, you, you're not being intimate with me. And I don't mean physically, I mean, emotionally intimate because we know addiction is about numbing out life, right? So whatever you use as your method of choice for numbing out life, it keeps you from being able to connect or attach to your loved one. You're not processing emotions. That's why you have an addiction because you're trying to numb your emotions, right? So you got to have emotions to share with other people. Um, so there's some uh, big similarities in the impact, but the process addiction of sexual addiction, um, because it takes away that that real personal aspect of the, of the couple's relationship, it has a, a greater impact. And I don't, I don't know if I'm really addressing, cause I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure how the distinction being process and substance is related to the impact of the coupleship in, in the question that's being asked. Yeah, um, I think you've, you've, you've okay. uh, answered it. Um, and, and if uh, you have a nuance to that, please share that in the question. But I think you have um, okay. just sharing some of the differences um, mm -hmm. that, like you said, it, more shame on spouse, partner, 
much versus more exciting. substance abuse that's mm -hmm. like right um yeah so. thank you Corey. because let me drill into that just a little bit more because a partner is going to say why wasn't i enough i'm not beautiful enough i'm not sexy enough i'm not good enough in bed i'm uh, I'm not enough. So there's a tremendous feeling of shame as opposed to if the addiction is alcohol or drugs. Well, a partner is never going to be alcohol or drugs. So she's not going to be comparing herself. Why couldn't I be alcohol enough? Or why couldn't I be drugs enough? Why couldn't I be gambling enough? Um, which is a process addiction too, right? So, um, so, but the sex piece is supposed to be part of the partner's experience. And that's why it has a greater impact, more shame. Thank you, Lori. Mark uh, uh, asks, could you discuss the steps to healing for the couple? I know in our mm -hmm. past webinar, we kind of got to this too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, disclosures mm -hmm. happen. Okay, now let's, let's try to heal. Okay, so there's there's been a therapeutic disclosure. There may even be a therapeutic separation uh, while the addict deals with recovery, goes into recovery, because um, he's um, he may not be safe for the partner to be with, okay? Um, and it may be actually healthier for his recovery if he isn't constantly in shame because he's disappointed his spouse. So there may be a therapeutic separation. If there is, you have a timeline, you have goals, um, you're clear about how the check-ins are going to be done. Um, so there may be that, but we work on the coupleship by working on the addict, learning how to have empathy for his partner and, and the harm that's been caused. And we work on the coupleship also by helping the partner learn emotional regulation skills, learning how to shift from resisting to allowing, like, but that's all in the course of boundaries, right? We don't just open ourselves back up to somebody who's been betrayed us because we're going to be hurt again. So it's this gradual process and it's very incremental and it takes, it takes time and people have to realize it's going to take a lot of time to repair, especially depending on how long the cheating's gone on. You know, if you suddenly realize 30 years into a marriage that the whole marriage has had this going on, that's going to be an awful lot of work to repair that damage. It doesn't mean it can't be done. I've seen couples um, both both do their own recovery work and they touch base with each other on what they're learning. They rebuild and they have a much stronger relationship than they ever thought possible. Just real quick, we passed the CE portion. This is the okay. Q&A portion. Uh, yeah, I, I'm that. going a little bit longer. I'm sorry, but because it took a little bit longer for me to get on the call, so... Yeah, uh, no, actually, Lori, you're good. I was okay. just trying to tell people that the CE portion has already ended. Okay. This is the Q&A that we want to, you know, always share with people and part of the accreditation part. Um, okay. But if you need, Sarah, like, for instance, you're asking, you're, you're free to go. We've got you. Um, we will be sending the link for the evaluation shortly after this, though. Okay, Lori, sorry, back to you for a second. <laughs> um, okay. Andrew says, what do you recommend for the perpetrator, the offend, I, and I'm not sure the language, I want to make sure I get the language right, yeah. but the offending person. What do I recommend? I recommend he goes to Begin Again Institute and get <laughs> his life cleaned up, that's what I recommend. <laughs> you know, this is a tough addiction to break. This is probably one of the toughest addictions to break. Um, and if it's trauma induced, you got to go back. You got to look at the trauma that created the addiction. Um, you got to get do your work on that. So, I mean, if you can afford an intensive, I say go to go to begin again, and and get that get that you know initial two week immersion into looking at what's happened, looking at your your patterns, your programming, get some good tools, do aftercare. Do your 12 step work. Um, you know, if the program works, if you work the program, yeah. you got to work the program. Yeah, Lori shared on the uh, partner side of it. Um, and, and this is the other part of the 14 day program is uh, there's the partner or 
How do we call the person? Partner who, support program, you mean? That That's that's mm -hmm. the partner. What? But anyway, I put a link to the 14-day men's intensive oh, that great, includes great. support from Lori and others for the partner um, in the chat here. And uh, it's based on Tensa, which you can see in the link there. You can go to the book at the top of the, mm -hmm. uh, the menu there for Begin Again. But um, mm -hmm. December 5th is the next intensive, 14 mm -hmm. days. So if you have someone to refer... Uh, hit that link and the admission teams at BAI, which is owned by and part of Integrative Life Center, who puts this webinar on today. Okay. Uh, Kelvin asks, have you found any differences between men's and women's response to betrayal trauma? Yes. And, and you mean in terms of whether the partner is male or female? Uh, yes. There's a lot of research that needs to be done on male partners because that's, you know, that's kind of an emerging area where there's more females who are acting, have problematic sexual behavior. Um, and, and anecdotally, I have only worked with one male partner. So I don't have a lot of um, personal experience with that. But what I can say is from the observation I have of that partner and talking with some of my other colleagues who've worked with male partners, it almost seems like their trauma is bigger than the female partners. Um, some of that is I'm sure because it's very unexpected in our culture that a woman would cheat on her husband. And it, um, I mean, we're almost like, oh yeah, all men do this kind of thing, but we don't say all women do this. So it becomes more of a shock. And also uh, I'm wondering too, if some of it is because men are so tied to feeling I mean, their sexuality and feeling like they're sexually powerful is so important to them. And if their wife is cheating on them, that that, that impacts them just as much, if not more, uh, than a woman is impacted in her feeling like, oh, what am I sexually inadequate for you? What's wrong? So um, the partner that I worked with, uh, I had all the same signs and symptoms of, of a woman, um, constant crying, PTSD, uh, scrambling, and, and he was a high level professional, just scrambling to try to get his life organized. He couldn't, couldn't figure out how to do it. But we do need more research on that. Yes, and you're right, Mark, there are more women having affairs versus men having affairs. So sad to say, women have bought the, um, that whole thing about life in the city and you know that we're sexually liberated and, and are making some bad choices themselves uh keith asks um would you recommend gender specific groups gender specific groups in terms of healing partners uh let's let's say and keith if you want to nuance your question but i'll say uh gender specific support pr support groups gender specific intensives uh and i'll just nuance that yeah. question just okay. so we can get your yeah I, I yes i would um okay. and and it's about safety because you're emotionally vulnerable when you're going through something like this you know whether you're the partner who's trying to recover from betrayal or you're the addict who's trying to clean up their act, if you will. Uh, there's a tremendous vulnerability there. And, and, and you wanna be in a place where you feel safe, where you're not gonna be like drawn to somebody who's going through the same trauma you're going through and perhaps get involved with them. So I think it's good if it is gender specific. Excellent. Lana says, can you recommend any resources other than or similar to affairrecovery.com for a young couple to access together to work towards healing after a couple of affairs have been disclosed? A little more information on that. A young couple does not feel it's a sexual addiction, which has been explored, but are still having difficulty with healing from the betrayals and repairing and building that trust. Yeah, yeah. I think um, Dr. Jake Porter has a platform called Choose Connection. And, uh, and you're right, it's not, you know, just because someone cheats on you doesn't always mean it's sexual addiction, just they cheated, right? Um, but he does a lot of work and he's getting ready to launch a new platform. It's um, daringventures.com is his website. 
So he's going to getting ready to launch a platform where he's going to have videos and check-ins and stuff like that. It's very uh, reasonably priced. Um, what was the website called? again? Daringventures.com. I think I can type it in here. I'm going to type it into the chat. Dr. Jake Porter. Jake is awesome. Okay. Oh, uh, let me get this. That only went to panelists, but that's okay. I'll, I'll oh, I'm care. sorry. Okay. It's okay. I'll take care of it for okay. you. That's what I'm here for. All right. <laughs> okay. okay, great. You just answered those questions. All right. Uh, if there's any other questions, um, hit the Q&A button. We, uh, we've pretty much got all of the questions that we've, we've that have been posted today, but we're here for you for another 15 minutes. If, but if not, uh, we'll release you to have the rest of your day back. While you're doing that, I'll say um, uh, just a reminder, shortly after this webinar ends, you'll get an email with an evaluation form, a link to an evaluation form. Please do that because you need to do that in order to get your certificate for today's CE credits. Brought to you by integrativelifecenter.com. Hey, um, so I'll ask a question, one last question. Um, could you tell us more about your work and where to find you next? Okay. Um, so I do a number of things. One of the things that I do is I'm the president of the Association of Partners of Sex Addicts Trauma Specialists. And we train and certify clinicians and coaches and we just opened up a whole new certification for religious leaders um, in trauma-informed partner-sensitive care. And we do that um, by uh, a series of programs where we train people in this model, explain the various aspects of trauma, how it shows up when it walks through the door of your office and treatment protocols to manage that. So I, it's, it's a great group of people. I'm so happy. It's a wonderful community. Um, I have a great board of directors and really awesome people who have been through our training. I also am a director of the Partner Support Program for Begin Again Institute. And in that work, what I do when um, the guys are in the 14 day intensive that Begin Again puts on, I work with their partners during that time. And we start out before the intensive, we have a group meeting that's virtual, it's online. And I talk about preparing for the intensive, what you can do to get yourself situated in terms of childcare, how you're gonna manage work, um, some self-care you're gonna do while he's there. And then during the intensive, partners get an email every day that has psychoeducation, a handout, a video, um, information to help them understand what's going on and take care of themselves. And then Monday and Thursday of both weeks, we have a two hour group where we meet to talk about all this. They have a private Facebook group where they meet um, and they 24 and seven, they're in touch with each other. And then the week after the intensive, we have another group where we get together and talk about how's it going? You know, what was it like? Um, and what I love, I've been doing this since July. The partners form these beautiful bonds. I say, this is the best place you never wanted to be. They form beautiful bonds with each other. Um, they, they get into a group me chat, you know, they're talking to each other all the time. They support each other during, um, one of the things they do is they write impact letters that the guys read during the intensive. They support each other offline on getting their impact letters done. They support each other during the 15 minute calls that happen in week two with their addict after he's read the impact letter. Um, it's just, they're so grateful not to feel alone. So I love that I get to do that. Yeah. So, and then I have my own private clients and we have an ongoing care group too. So after the intensive is over, the partners can choose to, to join an ongoing care group so they can continue work on their own healing. One last question, just kind of came in, but thank you for Lori for all of that. Uh, Melanie says, have you seen that the offender um, has, I guess, betrayer 
I, I don't, I'm not sure the terminology and I don't want to make yeah, sure. Offender I, is kind of a, I, it's kind of a legal term to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we, we do yeah. want to be really careful. Yeah, We want to be that. careful that we're not, not further apologizing further. someone's addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, so have you seen that the betrayer has trauma rebuild that is a contributing factor in their absolutely, activity? absolutely, absolutely. Um, without, I'm going to be careful what I say, I'm going to modify this story a little bit, so I'm not revealing any personal information, but um, I've worked with some male partners who have a huge history of betrayal trauma in their own lives, maybe being molested when they were little, could have been a same-sex molestation that happened, mom and dad were alcoholics, so after the molestation, what are they going to do? There's no place to go for comfort. They're, they're going to ride their trike around the garage over and over, hours and hours and hours. I could just cry when I think about it. Um, you know, some of the, the guys, um, there was physical violence in the home. No, is that true of everyone? No. I mean, again, going back to that earlier question, this right here means that porn is more easily available. So you don't necessarily have had to come from a traumatic background to, to get addicted, okay? Because porn is by its very nature, it's highly addictive. But, um, but for the severe acting out, I find most of the addicts that I've worked with had some type of trauma that created the underlying, either they were reenacting the trauma uh, I have more um, partners whose husbands that say they've done same sex acting out. Sometimes that's because they were molested same sex. Sometimes it's just because their addiction escalated to the point where, hey, men are easier to have sex with than women because women always want something from you. Men don't. It's like quick and done. Um, so, but often there is some type of underlying trauma and that's the beauty of the work that they do at Begin Again Institute because Dr. Barta understands that and they get in and they tenderly address that trauma as, as a very important aspect of healing. So I'm gonna put the, I put the wrong link in here, but if you go to that link, I just put, you can uh, download the first chapter of Dr. Barter's book called Tensa, Trauma-Induced Sexual Addiction. Um, Lori, thanks so much. I know this has been, uh, it's, it's your work, but it's also part of your story too. And and uh, we all appreciate you. You got a couple of comments coming in saying it's been so helpful to oh, share your perspective and uh, from the partner side of betrayal. Yes. All right, Lori. Well, yeah, thanks thank so much. Thanks so thank much. You for, I'm so sorry about the problems at the beginning. Oh my gosh. Talk about adrenaline. <laughs> it's like, this is going to work. I know it's going to work. We're going to get through this. You did great. Tech always <laughs> throws a wrench in the plan. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thank you from Integrated Life Center. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, look forward to that email about the uh, evaluation form so you can get your CE credits. Thank you all.